Okay, so we had a second poll there. Uh, what do you believe is the biggest current threat to academic integrity? <coughs> so I think that we can see it's self-explanatory how this is going. So uh, Gen AI assisting or completing assignments, it's deemed to be it's stopping the poll there, followed by the lack of understanding. Easy access to online essay services, inadequate consequences, and peer pressure. So I think, I, I, don't, I don't know, I think the 27th figure is probably higher. But this is what is perceived at the moment from our from our online viewers. So the AI, Gen AI, is the biggest threat. Okay, we're going to have a change in gear now. So we're going to uh, move on to the panel discussion side of things. There's a bit of uh, choreography that has to go on in the background. So um, maybe while we're doing that, we can have a look at some of the questions that we've already received. I'm giving a nod to someone in the background there. And so, um, yeah, so you can vote on these questions as well now um, and, and, and therefore kind of um, drive the discussion a bit. So there's four on the screen right now. If you find fake qualifications, whoops, are we approaching a post-plagiarism era? Well, I, I, I know that phrase post-plagiarism, one, one, one of our speakers coined it, I, I think. So that might be a good one to come back to. Any other ones there are worth? And maybe some of these might prompt people to think of some other ones there as well. Uh, if you find fake qualifications fraud about a person claiming to be such and such a professional, how does one report it um, anonymously and without repercussions personally? So it's an interesting thing about that, about maybe being able to um, be a kind of an anonymous whist whistleblower, if you like. There's scant uh, enforcement visible and many fear accusing others. So. That's interesting. Any others worth, uh, worth noting before we finish configuring ourselves here? Do you think that if we embrace an ability to use gen gen generative AI as a 21st century graduate skill, very interesting, it will change the narrative away from deter, catch, and punish? And that's from Tom Farley in the first row there. Very, very good point. OK, are we ready to take our places? Great. Okay, I have a question that I wanted to ask before we can take audience questions and, and I, I have the privilege of you know, being here. So my first question is, do you think there should be a reporting mechanism where students can report misconduct that they see, and do you think that should be anonymous or not? I can tell you that our university, we do have mechanisms for students to engage in peer reporting of misconduct, but it is not anonymous. Uh, and the reason for that is to prevent sort of retaliation, personality conflicts, etc. cetera. Um, and so the students must be able, or whoever it is doing the reporting, must submit their email address. Uh, it must be verifiable, and it will be checked. The name of the person reporting may not necessarily be disclosed to the student if there's enough corroborating evidence to follow up uh, with, with a misconduct allegation. So an initial reporting must be done with uh, an identified individual, but the identity of that individual may ultimately not be released to the person responsible if there's enough evidence. And, and just to just follow up on that, who has sight of that um, that information? That would be only administrators um, with uh, the proper auth authorization to conduct the investigation. So it has to be corroborated through evidence. Okay, thank you, Kane. Um, I actually do think there should be an anonymity um, where it's possible. Some systems don't allow it. My university actually does because we have to accept complaints from members of the public. But as a byproduct of that, we've had significant disclosures from contract cheating writers who weren't getting paid. So contractors tend to screw everyone they're involved with. Um, no honour among thieves. No honour among thieves. And, but also, like, students, I think, from, say, a wellbeing perspective and inappropriate, unwanted behaviour perspective, um, I think they, they're loath to, sometimes loath to be identified as the source of a report, I think it's mainly about who assesses it and what evidence supports it rather than necessarily the reporter. So I wouldn't make them identify if they did not wish to. Okay, interesting. And um, that do I understand correctly in, in that it's not just misconduct in um, academic matters, but it could be other... Absolutely. Okay, yep. so sexual, whatever, yep. yeah, so yep. it's the whole... Yep, sexual yeah. harassment, okay. sexual violence, okay. um, yeah, 
the the panoply of, of naughty. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Okay, so the, the first ranked question here from our poll is the one I just read out, actually. And, and may, so maybe it's the first ranked question because I read it out. But let me repeat it anyway and maybe give this one to you, Kane. Do you think that if we embrace an ability to use generative AI as a 21st century graduate skill, it will change the narrative away from the terror catch and punish. And mean, you mentioned generative AI yeah. to the end of your presentation, yep. real game changer. Is, is it, a, is it telling us to pause and maybe yeah, ask questions? I think it, it will and it absolutely should change the narrative. Um, we need to be thinking higher level in terms of how we defend the integrity of our degrees. At the moment, um, academics typically on a subject are solely responsible and academics have a vast array of pressures and incentives or disincentives and a, a variety of skill sets. So one academic might be genuinely interested, another academic might constantly turn their head because they're not interested or they simply don't know. They don't, they don't, can't read any of the signs. So I think we need to be thinking about how do we ensure learning has happened across a whole program and what assessment security needs to be in place thinking about different concepts rather than just hope, hitting and hoping, to use the vernacular. Okay, and making it less about catching, uh, catching and, uh, and punishing. I suppose as well as that, I mean, if we are trying to prepare our students for the workplace of the future, or even the workplace of right now, I mean, it doesn't seem appropriate or valid to just try outrightly to ban things like, like chat GPT. What, what do you think, Sarah? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, and you're absolutely correct about employers using this technology today across a variety of industries. I can give an example in our own university. Our senior communications director has, um, together with some folks at the university, developed an app to write uh, the communications, the external communications posts, the news items that go out to the community by uh, feeding the AI app all of the previous news items that were written over the past five years and can now generate very quickly in a matter of minutes a uh, uh, press release or an online article about something that's happened. Hey, our university won the football game this past weekend. Isn't that terrific? Uh, and can choose a professional tone, uh, an academic tone, or um, a, you know, a community-based tone. And so our senior communications official has says to me, he doesn't have lower level jobs for interns anymore. What he needs is people to be able to read the content, uh, edit it, make informed decisions about it, and know the background of the university enough. So in other words, I mean, you've probably heard this before, and I'll echo it again, that the jobs won't be lost to AI. They'll be lost to people who know how to use the AI. So teaching our students to use this will help prepare them to their workforce, and it's already happening across industries. But how do they get the scores right? That's what we need the human fact checkers for. Okay, uh, very interesting. So I suppose we're talking about a potential change maybe to the curriculum, but also, as you say, a change to our business processes and maybe, you know, maybe there's other changes that need to happen in terms of the policies and procedures and, and so forth. Like even academics, if they thought about a lit review, you know, that can be quite kind of tedious and time consuming to really, especially when the vast majority of it, most people have already read. And so like the do something like a lit review and then just be s focused on what's come out since the last publication you might have made. That, to me, seems a really valid way to use it, as long as someone's looking at it afterwards and going, I, I think that's less important, I think that's more important. I think there'll be lots of little simple ways people start using it and then going further and further in. Okay. We, ways we're quite comfortable with e ethically, so as long as there's a human in the loop. We're, we're as long as there's a hu human in the loop. Okay. And like that academic has responsibility for that work. And that's really the key element. It's like you're still responsible whether you use that tool or that tool or just did it by pure human. Okay, will we move on? Um, is there another poll question? Or are there any questions in the audience? Oh, so Brendan. Uh, piece there for a moment. Um, I, I tend to, to agree with yourselves there that ultimately, particularly when you're dealing with, with agreed policies and procedures, it's 
when you get to the anonymous bit that the process fails is because somebody feels that they're entitled to who is accusing me of this. Now, I agree you don't always have to reveal. If, for example, a lecturer's and a group of students, here's a great website that'll help you write your assignment. You don't need to know which one of the students actually brought this to their head of department because it went to all of them. But somebody at some point is going to have to be the accuser, so where that actually happens in terms of because there may be disciplinary issues. In, in a more general note, and, and having thought about this over you know, the last number of years, and particularly recently, our own Minister for Education has backtracked on, on in assessment of students in the second level cycle uh, by the teachers because of the concerns around GPT. Um, I personally, I think that's a retrograde step because banning GPT is almost like banning the internet. Um, you know, at this point, you know, banning air even, like, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. So we have to deal with that. And I'm certainly uh, was, was very taken by your sense that this is not an issue of catching and punishing. And if you take the parallel, certainly in this country, you take maybe the difference between smoking and speeding. There, it's the, the influence of cultural change on people's mind in terms of how successful those are, particularly in the case of smoking. I mean, one time when I was in school, in primary school, teachers smoked in the classroom. We smoked in, in homes where the children, we smoked in other people's homes, we smoked in the workplace, we smoked in, in pubs. Now all of that is gone. And it doesn't really need to be enforced in the main because people observe it because it's not the thing to do. Speeding, on the other hand, is, some, is still something that's still very much um, that has to be enforced. I notice when I drove from Sligo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God. I thought you were going to say in office yesterday. <laughs> so in the same instance here, the culture change that we have to try and impose is what we've done with smoking rather than what we're trying to do with speeding. And that's the change. And I think the, the point that you make around assessment is certainly... Um, I think there's a, there, there is a received wisdom out there that academic excellence determines everything about the individual. Mm. And of course, what it does is that it, it just determines that they were good at passing exams because in terms of uh, an, an individuals, and uh, you, if you probably did a, a survey or a, a study on that, you say, yeah, people who do, do well in university tend to do very well. But there may be, I, I think that's done to the exclusion of an awful lot of other parameters, such as things like ambition, self-confidence, uh, your social status, Equity you know, first issues. Like all, of all, all of those things as well. Yep. Because there's not an insignificant grouping of our students who perform very poorly academically, but actually are quite successful. And also, on the other hand, students perform particularly well that actually turn out to be dead loss when they go into the employment market. So is this an opportunity to look at how we assess students in maybe in a different format, maybe determining actually how good they really are rather than what a really very antiquated system mm. in many regards is of actually assessing those students in terms of and, and almost setting them up for life with that brand as to how they got on Absolutely. in the final degree. Absolutely. Like, you know, we assess like it's, with the exception of the internet, we assess like it's 1932 in many ways. Um, the way that I tend to think about it, like you, you mentioned exams, uh, exams are a kind of, it's called fair because everyone gets the same paper. But the student who had to work, you know, 16 hours over the previous weekend has a very different experience than the student whose parents can pay for them. They were well rested. They had plenty of time to study. We don't kind of, um, we, we don't police fairness in a whole range of ways we equity issues and students with disability we don't consider whether that 10 minutes at the end of the exam that they get extra equalizes the fairness we kind of assume that it does despite evidence to the contrary and so i tend to think about how can we best enable students to demonstrate their learning rather than us testing it obviously it's two functions we want to test it but how can we best enable them to demonstrate it and so when we think about program level outcomes and incentivizing learning rather than assessment, I think we can start to think about things radically differently and s start to think about what we should stop doing and what we might be able to commence doing. 
Thanks, Kane. Sarah, don't you add anything? Yeah, maybe I can just plus what, what Kane was talking about there with regards to equity. Um, colleague of mine, Yuso Neiman, and I just did a study uh, called Our Assessment Accommodations Cheating. Uh, and we looked at policies across Canadian universities and assessment or you know adjustment equity policies for students. And by and large, we found that accommodation policies for academic accommodations start with the premise, students will cheat. Um, you know, in your exam room, your accommodated exam room, you must do this, you must do that, must be invigilated, but it all starts with this premise of you're a bad person and we must ensure that you uphold the, the rules and regulations rather than starting from the position that Kane has suggested and others have suggested of show us what you can learn, show us what you can do uh, and then go from, go from there. I think if we make that shift then it would change the conversation rather than trying to prevent cheating but rather offering students the opportunity to demonstrate their learning to us. Thank you. Do you want to go next to I pick another one? Um, go for it, if you want. Okay, no, I'll just, I'll just read the one I can see best. Sorry, how do I approach <laughs> academic integrity with my students? And I suppose to me that comes to um, um, the fact that we have uh, developed and we have bought um, modules for academic integrity both for students and staff. Um, they're there on our VLE, which is Canvas, so students can do them. I do believe, and, and Garoud can, can correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the take-up is very small. And the reason, I think, it seems to me is that if, if the students are not if it's not compulsory, if it's not, you know, assessed in some way, it isn't done. So, uh, and I'm just talking about one module, and we're talking here about, I suppose, um, embedding academic integrity through, through the whole program, not just a module. So if they're not to be asked to do it compulsory or as a part of their study, how, how, how is it best to do that? It's a simple question. It doesn't have a very simple answer. I tend to think about the kind of Swiss cheese analogy that we need multiple approaches and that's used as a kind of um, holistic defence to cheating. But if we think about it from an academic integrity perspective, we need multiple touch points. So simply having a module and quite often those, and Sarah mentioned this the other night, that those modules are often used as punishment. They're part of the punishment when a student breaches academic integrity. And that doesn't seem to really be a very supportive lesson to the idea that you should act with integrity. Here's the punishment for failing. Um, I tend to think that we need it more embedded in units and be something that we talk about in terms of basic examples um, to be able to understand students' lives a little bit more. So to talk about that when on Sunday night, if it's half past 11 and you're running out of time. How, what other options do you have? Because students and, you know, alone in their bedroom on a Sunday night, it seems very lonely there, where if they were more aware of what the options were, even at that point, they might make a dis different decision. Um, Sarah? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm in a bit of a different position because I study this, but I often start with a conversation with my students. We don't always have a lot of time in our courses, right? So if I have time, I will engage in a conversation with students about what does ethical learning mean to you, and what would you expect from me in terms of ethical teaching? And we can sort of set up our expectations, uh, you know, on a whiteboard, your expectations of me, my expectations of you, and sort of do it that way. If we don't have a lot of time, I can start with a really simple intro in my class and say, I care about integrity, and I hope you will too. We've got our policies and procedures. They're there. Uh, I don't really expect you to read them, but it is an expectation of the organization, the institution. But what I can say to students is, I care about integrity, and I care about you. So if you find yourself in a position where you're on the verge of making a decision that you might regret later, talk to me. Send me an email before you make that decision. Whether it's I'm running out of time and I might need some help with my assignment. Before you go and get that help, come and talk to me. Because we're here as an organization and a learning institution to help you. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to a colleague of mine at the University of Calgary because she has what I think is a brilliant um, uh, tactic, I guess, that she uses in her course syllabus, and we have a little bit of flexibility to do this. If you know the game Monopoly, my colleague Meadow Schroeder uses what she calls a get out of jail free card for students on her syllabus, right? She said every student gets one get out of jail free card a semester. It gives you a seven day extension on any assignment, no questions asked, no doctor's note. Um, and you can use that at any point in the semester. It's up to you. You have agency uh, when and if you want to use it. And she said students do cash in from time to time, but lots of students don't. 
but they like having the option. They like having the agency to be able to come and say, I'd like to, I'd like to use my get out of jail free card without a lot of explanation. You know, grandma's died for the seventh time. We don't really need to hear it. We've been around long enough that we don't play that game. Just, I just want to use my card. Okay, good enough. And on we go. But I think treating students as adults um, and treating them with dignity and offering them an option to make the right decision is really helpful for them in their learning. I would actually agree with that. I argue internally in my own university that students should just get a number of days per semester to be able to use str strategically. And because it removes some of the pressure to make bad choices. So when they're alone at 11.30 on a Sunday night, they might go, I can claim those two days and it gets me out of jail in a legit way. And I, I also think we do a lot of things from arbitrary reasons. Again, we call it fairness. When we ask students to provide a doctor's certificates to get an extra day, we go, that's unfair to all the other students. But it doesn't recognise the complexity of that student's life. They might already be in a bit of an unfair situation compared to someone who has to work less or a, a range of other life factors. So, yeah. Um, the other thing I would say when I think about it, we also we talk about deterrence and that's usually like messages on a website cheating it's not worth it or something like that, that actually doesn't deter anyone. That actually works for those who are pre-deterred, the champions. It, we need to start to think about what signals are we, concrete signals are we actually sending to students that say this is a risk to you and here's a better way. So if they get a signal that says we are taking these steps to ensure the integrity of this assessment, but here's the writing centre. You're sending both a kind of negative message, but it, it gives them a clearer picture of the risks that they're running. And I mean, I'll add one more thing there as well, and thinking of our students as, as human beings, I mean, you heard it from Kane and you heard it from me, but I mean, as an academic, I often ask for extensions on my work. Thanks, book editors, right? And you get this- I'm always on time. Oh, oh yeah, right, sure. <laughs> okay, and then suddenly you get this note in your inbox. Dear colleague, a gentle reminder, your manuscript is due, and you're like, oh, gosh, all right. Um, but if, as an academic, I ask for those extensions, or I submit a manuscript with APA errors, sorry, book editors, um, I mean, I think I can extend the same courtesy and dignity to, to my students. Sometimes we ask our students to be perfect when we're not perfect ourselves. Thank you, Sarah. I was listening to you and I was thinking, you know, it is it must be discipline specific because I think of it only from my point of view, which is maths, and I think I have a little bit of an idea of how to mitigate that or what to do with my assessment. But I, uh, it's probably completely different to, in you know, business and humanities where essays were the way to go or um, um, multiple choice questions were the way to go. And we saw in the latest presentation of um, Phil Newton in, in uh, last week that Chad GPT-4 would do most of the um, bar exams and law exams and 50,000 of huge, huge, um, I suppose, uh, research on that. Uh, 50,000 exams, I think they had um, looked at um, throughout and they've, they've passed them all. So it is a completely a game changer from even from ChatGPT 3.5. So it's it's easy for us to say, okay, this is, you know, it, it's just, it's very kind of hard to know where do we, I suppose, where do we go from here and how to, you know, we know that there shouldn't be online exams, but it's just, it's very hard, I think, for, 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 for staff to know how to reassess, how to put in the assessing assessment in place. And we need to really, you know, help is needed, I think, in that area. And I do think it's discipline specific. So I suppose my question was, should there be almost a faculty approach or a, a departmental approach or something so that, you know, there's advice in, you know, in the particular discipline? Yes. Yeah, the, I mean, the, uh, the brief answer is yes. And it's not a one-size-fits-all, right? If we're, we're talking about things like universal design for learning uh, and equitable versus equal, that applies as much to our academic disciplines as it does to, to individual students. So I come from a humanities background. My first two degrees were in literature. Then I defected over to education. Um, but I, I mean, for those who work in STEM, my largest class, I think, ever in my career maybe has been 65 students, right? And I think for a math professor, that's a dream. Um, right, so I don't deal with those first year mega lectures of a thousand, a thousand students. Uh, so we deal with different conditions in our teaching uh, and so different approaches to assessment I think is actually equitable. I tend to think about assessment at a program level as a team sport. So I have some insights into how cheating happens and what assessment security means in certain contexts. 
the well-being and dis, um, disabilities folks have a lot to say about what is universal design for learning. There's subject matter expertise. There's people who can think about how curriculums work at a high level versus what are the learning outcomes from that module. So rather than thinking about the kind of academic controlling their fife, I think it's probably going to imply a certain amount of release of control, but a lot more support. Thank you. OK, question there from Killian. Have you guys got the mic? Yeah, I have, Chris. yeah. Um, just, I was interested that Macquarie University has five staff working in this area, and I believe that's quite common in Australia, that you have people who help prosecute these things and, and everything like that. I'm not a cop. Uh, no, um, but, uh, well, what uh, my question is, should every university have at least a couple of people working in this area, both in prevention, uh, supporting staff uh, in preventing, as well as supporting staff in making this happen? and also helping to advise senior management when they're making decisions that they keep this in mind. Uh, I mean, we've had situations here where we've had traffic jams locally where large numbers of young men with laptops have been going into two single houses to do exams together. You know, mm. so, uh, so should each college and each university have some sort of office and should that be a national policy? I would have to say absolutely. Um, I think faculties have a range of incentives and disincentives to um, I'm not saying they're dishonest but I'm saying that when resources are at a premium when it might reflect poorly on leadership or reflect poorly on particular academics I think faculties struggle and even just basic access to data I think faculties struggle to do this work effectively um, I think you were saying something this morning um, and now I'm trying to think of what it was it's, it's lost but absolutely I think that realistically you don't get a big picture of what's actually happening across the whole university and therefore you're not able to feed up the risks appropriately oh no no that was it it was like the the lecturer who works really hard in this space and looks like their course is particularly prone to cheating I see it the other way. I look at all those zeros and go, what are you doing? And so you can end up kind of having an external group put a bit more pressure um, rather than just allowing the zeros to sit quietly in the corner. Yeah, we, we don't have that in Australia. So I'm listening to Kane thinking, when do we get this in Canada? <laughs> and I was going to ask, what... What gave you that mandate, if you like? What helped you make the case to be that well resource. There's a bit of a story it was there a in scandal. Australia, I think, isn't it? Was it was a yeah. scandal um, in about end of 2014, 2015. Um, there was a company called My Master and they were running an online essay mill. And the first thing, I think it was about a thousand students, 16 universities across the country. And the first thing that our registrars or vice chancellors knew about it was on the front page of one of Australia's biggest papers that tends to focus the mind and open the wallets. Um, and so, yeah, like not all places have one, but plenty do. And I think even increasing numbers do. Um, obviously resources are, and we tend to get combined with other functions such as complaints. And so where I would prefer to be doing more um, kind of positive work in the academic integrity space, I end up having to do complaints, but and so I give what I can there, but yeah. And so I tend to choose how I focus my energies. Okay, I, I'm just gonna take one from the poll here just to keep things even with the, with the online audience. And I'm gonna pick from the end there, uh, in part because it's the shortest question, so therefore easiest to read out, but also because I know it's a specific interest of yours, uh, Sarah, are we approaching a post-plagiarism era? What, what would it even mean to say that we're entering a post-plagiarism era? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, thanks for the, for the question that came in. 
Um, this for me as a plagiarism scholar was born out of work when I was studying um, the work of Rebecca Moore Howard, who's a plagiarism scholar in the US. She advocates for throwing the term plagiarism out of our policies. She said it has nothing to do with morality. This is a skills development issue and we need to work on, focus on student learning. And I thought about that and I thought, well, okay, what, what if we threw out this from our policies? I don't think it's going to happen. But then I, what, what if we transcend it? Like what would cause us to go beyond our current definitions of plagiarism, most of which would go back to the Industrial Revolution um, and uh, the ways that we enforce student behavior in terms of plagiarism being a misbehavior that must be punished. What if we didn't punish it? What would it look like then? And in the age of generative AI, I don't think traditional definitions of plagiarism apply anymore because cut and paste plagiarism it can easily be replaced by chat GPT. In fact, you can do it faster uh, and easier. So what does it look like in an age where human AI writing, hybrid writing is the norm. We talk about the outputs of things like ChatGPT as if they're somehow static, and yet we know that they can be edited, uh, revised, remixed, added to, such that the output in the end is neither written by a human nor written by an AI, uh, and that we can't really detect where the human ends and where the, the robot, uh, for lack of a better word, begins. And so that uh, idea of detection becomes somewhat futile. And when that happens, the plagiarism becomes a thing of the past, and the old definitions just don't, don't apply. Um, so w uh, this is the age I think we're living in where AI is normal uh, and then further there will be other advanced technologies that will come and eventually replace AI and thinking forward about what will that mean. We're not there yet, but I think as educators we can be thinking towards that eventuality. Okay, so hybrid writing is also one of the characteristics of this era and I suppose we're, in a way we've had like AI powered tools for quite a long time since long before chat GPT and generative AI came along. It right? tells me when I've done a typo in my emails. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You know, that's AI and we use it in lots of little ways and it's just now using it in bigger ways, more obvious ways. So there's, there's almost a continuum. There's things we've been perfectly happy with for a long time but now we're getting to that place where we're getting a little bit more uncomfortable or it's asking difficult questions of us. The other thing that I actually agree, unsurprisingly, but I agree for different reasons. Um, I think we've been assessing artifacts, especially in certain disciplines for a long, long time. And those artifacts are no longer reliable for us. And so it doesn't really matter whether, in, in my view, long term, I think having students produce artifacts which may or may not be copied out of Wikipedia is not really a very effective demonstration of learning now and it wasn't last year before ChatGPT, and it's not going to be next year when ChatGPT 4 is 5 is better. Um, I tend to think about how we go about encouraging learning through a degree and how secure our um, demonstrations, our learning demonstrations can be rather than an endless series of continuing assessment because I think it's been atomised and students Generally, it contributes to stress. I, I don't think it has many upsides anymore. Very good. Okay. Um, hi. Yeah, I really liked your slide um, that showed how all of the students were interconnected. Um, and I have a question about that. It's probably a really easy answer because I don't understand any of that data. Um, so is there a chance that there could be a cat and mouse um, situation going on here? Um, so say that every university now employs five people to do this, um, and they do it really effectively. Um, but the incentive to cheat is still there. So instead of doing whatever it is to show that picture, now the companies are doing why to sh show something slightly different. But actually, it's still ongoing. It's just that we've been very effective at communicating to them that we're now onto them, so they have to do something slightly different. Like even if you take the, um, the, the slide with the coloured cells, you know, that, th what you're saying is true to an extent, except we have much more visibility of what Y is. So the, the coloured cells slide, that was from 2018, and frankly they were really stupid. You know, 100 students from the same IP address, or the same pair of IP addresses, becomes pretty obvious and we correlated that with document data. Now, the example in the, in the network 
is lots of different IP addresses, except it becomes an economic burden for them. It becomes more difficult to manage. So when you have a team of people providing these services for students, it's much more difficult for them to be really, really rigid and keep to the same IP address from the same node all the time. And the other problem that students have when you think about it across subjects, they're not gonna have the same person delivering the same services via the same IP addresses all the time. So you can kind of start to see it like that. As I said, it's about the visibility of the thing rather than going, oh, we don't know what this means anymore. We can see there's changes and it's just our views about what they mean. Okay, I'll just pick out another question here from the from the poll, and and, and uh, people uh, who are here in person can maybe think about some some questions they might want to ask as well. So, we've kind of been over this ground before, but maybe there's a different angle on it here. So, the second question there: If you find fake qualifications fraud about a person claiming to be ex-professional, claiming to be a particular kind of professional, how does one report it in anonymity and without repercussions personally? And, and this uh, this, this uh, person adds, there is scant enforcement visible, and many fear accusing others. So you're going to get pulled into the thing, and you know that's going to have repercussions on you. And there's little evidence of of, of enforcement in the first place, perhaps. Any any one of you want to take that? <laughs> you're ready to go there. The way yeah. that I think about it, it would be very very simple. I think from an investigator's point of view, the most important thing is the evidence that this thing has occurred. So if someone sends me an email from dobbing in joe at gmail.com, I'm much more concerned with what the evidence and how objective it is and how can I check it some other way rather than taking someone's word for it. When I get a bunch of text and it doesn't have any evidence, that has, it's a much weaker position and I'm not necessarily in regard to degree fraud but other things. I'm much less likely to take the next step unless I have some other way to check that information. Uh, I would concur and also wanted to speak to the difficulty in reporting fake and fraudulent credentials. So I've uh, dealt with a couple of um, allegations, I can say, in a couple of different disciplines. People have come to me now because they know I study this and they say I want to report uh, you know, so-and-so in, in this particular profession. If the profession has a professional body attached to it, say psychologists, which in Canada need to be registered, um, so or engineers, or nurses, or social works. Uh, reporting it to the accrediting body or the licensing body can be one way to go about that. I will say, same as Kane, 100%. You need to have full evidence of that, uh, and then possibly be able to, you know engage in a conversation with the professional licensure body about how to investigate. Some of these bodies have no systems in place for how to investigate um, fraud from their professionals. And I can give you another example that is actually in the final chapter of our book, and it's about um, academics. So I've been on a number of hiring committees. We're asked to do this as service, right? You may be the same in your university. And at our university, our human resources um, department, which is very good, and very understaffed, has no mechanisms to check the academic qualifications of people who apply for academic jobs um, at our university. And it's not uncommon across Canada. And there was a case that uh, made the news a few years ago about a uh, dean of medicine, now dismissed, at the University of Alberta. Um, and he came in, gave a, a speech, a graduation speech, that his students sat in the audience and found to have been plagiarized. This dean of medicine plagiarized the graduation speech. Students found it, put it on social media. Dean was disgraced. School of medicine was disgraced. The dean was invited to resign. Um, and then only later did it come out that he had come from the UK, uh, this is all public knowledge now, uh, where he had been dismissed because he had been in the medical practice there and had been dismissed from his post as a medical professor for one of the worst cases of ne uh, medical negligence in the UK, according to the judge who had heard the case. Was dismissed from the University of Nottingham, came to the University of Alberta, where they didn't do the proper background checks, became the Dean of Medicine, plagiarized, was invited to resign, which he did. You say, well, we're invited to resign, right? You know what that means. Um, and then, where did he go next? Australia. 
um, where presumably the Australians failed to check, did the proper background checks. So academia, I think, is one of the most vulnerable professions or the sector. We need better ways of ensuring that the people who come into our sector <coughs> actually have the credentials that we claim. They could have done a Google search. Exactly, <laughs> which is what we did in Canada when we started connecting the dots on this fella. It was all public knowledge if someone had cared <coughs> to check. Um, you know, I'm listening and I'm just realizing that reputation is a funny thing. You could do something, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and you, you could stop doing the thing and everybody remembers and thinks, oh, you know, you're the person that cycles or you're the person that whatever, you know, and it's only uh, re the reputation of all institutions is so important because you, you only need one scandal of somebody that has done something in especially in a, in a position of authority, and that is with you for decades. And it's very, very hard to shake that off. Uh, thanks. Uh, another question from Ashling there? Have I turned that on? Yeah. Hi. Listen, I've really enjoyed the conversation this morning. I just wanted to talk about modeling good behavior. And, you know, some things I've seen are around, you know, having academic integrity champions maybe distributed, you know, through faculty and the different... Uh, I suppose sections of the university as a whole. What's your take on that? Do you think is that a good approach, or is there something else we should be doing? I think it's one. It's one approach uh, for sure of modeling the good behavior, and that's in that comprehensive academic integrity framework. And at the same time, communicating that that doesn't mean that we're infallible. Like I often tell people, I don't get up in the morning and polish my halo. Honestly, right? And I remember um, copying from the Encyclopedia Britannica when I was in grade three, age eight, um, for a social studies assignment. I know you're like, uh, right? Yeah, guilty as charged. Um, and I still remember the teacher didn't catch it, or if they did catch it, then they didn't care to report it. Um, but I really thought at the time, like, I can't say it any better, so I just copied. Um, but to say that we are not infallible ourselves, and I kind of see it like, um, you know, uh, one of my favorite leadership and community development scholars is a, a woman by the name of Margaret Wheatley, and she talks about um, leadership as a daily practice, that we get up in the morning and we do the best we can to lead in the best way we know how, and at the end of the day, we forgive ourselves for whatever we didn't do, uh, and then we get up the next day, and it's part of that daily practice. I see integrity the same way. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. Uh, you know, occasionally, you know, we, we might have plagiarized when we were eight years old and still remember it almost 50 years later. Um, that being that, but to, to convey that we're not above others, we're on, we're on the same level as our students. And if students end up making a poor decision, I think it's your colleague, Kath Ellis, that said that that should not be a catastrophe and ruin the rest of their lives. And how do we move on from a transgression and go on to uh, not become a serial repeater or repeat offender, uh, but then we can move on with our lives. I would agree. I think it should be plainly obvious that students aren't all the same. So students come in with different motivations, different stresses, different levels of capability, different you know, energy. And so, sure, champions are absolutely important. They can really extend the reach of, and we can work with them and extend the messages out into the student groups. But by the same token, there's other students who are at the kind of opposite end of this the spectrum, we need to kind of cater for all of those things and their students. I think during COVID, COVID was quite instructive because when we kind of took away some of the guardrails, cheating did go up, cheating blew up. STEM in particular, like you took away in-person exams and cheating went through the roof. And so it gives you a different view. You go, oh, students aren't all, you know, they're weighing up that risk and some went, yeah, okay, that's worth the risk. And so it gives you a more nuanced view of who students as a total group truly are. But champions, are absolutely, yeah. We should engage with them more. Yeah, as I was listening to you, I was just thinking of one of the keynotes at the conference, um, one of the speakers that said, people cheat, students are people. So it isn't at all about uh, them versus us. We're all people. We have all done something. Um, I think I certainly have anyway, and it is... Uh, about you know restorative justice and support for everybody, staff and students, and that academic integrity culture and all that work that needs to be done. Just on that, like that thing when we go into really punitive misconduct processes, I think that can kind of other students. It's like we've cast them out. You're the you know you're the black sun now, and I think when we can kind of engage them in a process which, as you say, is restorative, you can restore their, like, the restore the marks, if you will, 
but also restore them to a place in our community rather than kind of leaving this permanent stain like you just stamped them. Arneev, did you have a question I said earlier? Um, thanks very much. In, in MTU, we always, um, I suppose, we always talk about being student-centred. And I sit on the infringement panel here in Cork, so unfortunately I see it, you know, after the deed is done, before it can be caught. But one thing I notice is that often there's very human stories behind what led a student to make that decision. And I mean, when you sit on the board, you, you get a real insight into students' lives, be it you know, healthcare for family members, gambling addiction, all different types of real human stories is what you hear. But the policy we always try to do is having a proportional response to what they have done. Often it might be maybe a 40% assessment and it's 50% plagiarized. But the question is, is that sometimes academic staff who aren't privy to the personal information get very hurt Outraged by, sometimes. Uh, what they perceive as a very lenient punishment given to a student, whereas we try we try to be proportional uh, on the board, uh, and they t they do take it you know quite personally, and I can understand that they've invested their time, they have you know gone to the effort of bringing it to the board and p p compiling the evidence, but but what would you say to an academic staff member who feels that actually the board was far too lenient on that student? Like, what do you say to them to say? that, you know, there was a reason behind that. You know, it wasn't us not doing our duty, but, you know, we were trying to put in a proportional response. I think when you kind of bring these processes out from behind the curtain, like you think about the Wizard of Oz and he's back there pulling levers, um, I think it's not like literally you're doing it in the middle of the courtyard, but what the process is becomes clearer. So it's not hidden in a PDF somewhere. Um, when you work from a, a kind of principles base, like for example, like, and different places can choose different things, but I look at learning and where learning hasn't occurred. And that tends to set my baseline. So for example, like let's say a student goes into a, um, or oh, submits a 40% essay, which we got evidence that they contract cheated and we find that so objectively or as objectively as possible, we can say learning didn't occur, and that tends to set our baseline, but also that over-punishment thing. So I don't think we can kind of be, we have to be proportional in the sense of one assignment is way down the bottom of the scale of cheating. So it can still be bad. Contract cheating is unacceptable and it's kind of worse than plagiarism, but they're both failures of learning. And I think when we can communicate to academics and talk about there's these steps, so like we're looking at whether this thing did or didn't happen, and then we're looking at, okay, what were the, some of the reasons behind that? But sometimes they get conflated by decision makers. So in a sense, it kind of waters the whole thing down where they need to s look at them in, as two very different things. Did this thing happen? What is its meaning in learning terms? And then what can we, because sometimes you just, doesn't matter. It could have been, you know, your father died yesterday. And you can take some unusual steps too. Like if that happened and a student contract cheated, submitted a contract cheated essay, I would probably say kind of go back to zero and reset. But in other circumstances, I would go, you lost 40% and that might mean failure. So those kind of mitigating circumstances, but we have to actually look at what, impact did they actually have on that event? Yeah, and I can appreciate that response. I've heard it in my own university as well, and it can be a deterrent to subsequent reporting on the part of the academic who might feel that they put all this effort into the incident report or whatever it took to bring it forward to the panel, and they're like, well, I don't know the outcome. And there's, I think, a couple of different things that come into play. One, to reassure the colleague that the process is sound. Um, that you and your colleagues, you have a process, you followed the process, you went, underwent the investigation, you considered a variety of different pieces, some of which the reporting individual may know about 
and there may be other bits that they don't know about, and you may not be allowed to tell them. Um, so, for example, I think it's a you know GDPR here, um, and sometimes privacy can be a thing to hide behind. But uh, effectively, students have a right to privacy. Um, it's not a public criminal trial. That there may be other factors that that come into it, but you as an investigative panel may be privy to to additional information. Um, and so it's not a naming and shaming thing. We're not going to go put their boards out there and say this week's cheaters are you know and and so on and so forth. But to, to reassure your colleagues that collegial governance works, that the process works, that you take it seriously, and to, to thank them, like, I know you put a lot of effort into this, and it may seem like the process is a black hole. Uh, let me assure you that it's not, and we take it seriously. We investigate everything thoroughly, and the outcome's based on the entire investigation. Um, so I think a little bit of explanation of the process and reassuring them you did the right thing, and please trust us that we did the right thing, too. Thank you very much. I know this, and I don't know what Neve was talking about because we do sit on the same board, and I know that even very conservatively, we're supposed to have at more than 10% of students that admit to misconduct, and numbers that go through the board do not reflect anywhere near that. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a very fine balance here. But look, unfortunately, I think we are out of time. Sorry, <laughs> I'm very, no. sorry. very sorry. Um, um, I think I'm getting looks here that, that um, we were. We're done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I just wanted to thank, um, I don't even know in which order. Firstly, I suppose the Department of Tell. I know it looks easy. I it is not. Um, Shane and uh, Brendan and Roisin and Garoud, I mean, it would be, would not be, I mean, it, it's flawless. It wouldn't have been flawless. There's a lot of work put into it. My only little criticism is that there's no hair and makeup provided, but I think they've <laughs> they've said I that they I could have used it more than anyone, I think. <laughs> I've been promised. I've been promised that that is. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, I, I just want to thank the our registrar uh, here in Cork, Anya, uh, and uh, indeed uh, the registrar in Kerry. They all been always have been very supportive. I think of academic integrity matters, and um, I think we we need that because. You know, I suppose they are the guardians of the academic integrity in, in the institution. And um, the Entusher teams and Louise and nationally and um, locally as well. Um, Grode, I did, I did, thank you. And I want to thank the speakers for, for coming here. So um, am I missing anybody obvious? Well, yourself, I think. Yes, thanks, I uh, thanks very much, for Violetta, for organizing all of this. Yeah. And no. for being such a great champion for academic integrity in, in our university. Garamakwiv, Claire, thank you very much, everyone. Hey. Thank you.